Jordan Peterson has become a global celebrity by weaving together mythology, science, philosophy and religion into a compelling theory of everything. One of the most influential philosophers of the last decades did something similar. Ken Wilber is the creator of Integral Theory, another attempt to pull together much of the world's knowledge and spiritual traditions into a theory of everything. Integral Theory gained a big following in the 90s and 2000s and remains influential. After serious health problems over the last decade, Ken Wilber is now returning to the conversation. What do these two hugely influential thinkers have in common? Where do they disagree? And what can they learn from each other? A lot of times when it comes to Jordan Peterson, it's not that I'll disagree with much of what he says. I, I, I agree with much of what he says. It's some of the things that he leaves out. I find this a little bit interesting because he's clearly an integral thinker. To get the most out of this film, we'll need to introduce a little integral terminology. At the core of integral theory is the idea that cultures and societies go through specific levels of development in the same way as individuals do, becoming more sophisticated as they develop or grow up. It's an idea that's common to developmental theorists, including Peterson's favourite, Jean Piaget. You move from one knowledge structure to the next one, which includes the previous one and is better. And it's better because it covers more territory. That's how you know it's better. It does the same thing the old tool does, plus some additional things. So it's a definition of better. Integral theory represents this development as a spiral. In this film, we'll mostly be talking about amber, tribalism, ethnocentric, authoritarian, which first emerged about 5,000 years ago. Orange, modern values, the rational self that emerged 300 years ago with the liberal democracies and the beginning of universal values. Green, the values of relativism, multiple perspectives, dialogue and consensus, human rights, sometimes called postmodern, which emerged fully in the 1960s. If they're healthily integrated, they support each other but each of them can believe that their way of looking at the world is the only true way, and then they are mutually exclusive. For Wilbur, the incomprehension between these worldviews is what's causing many of the worst excesses of the culture wars. Above these levels, Wilbur says, is another level called integral or second tier. From this perspective, it's clear that each of the previous ways of seeing the world has value and needs to be integrated. This seems like a really good point to talk about Jordan Peterson. Yeah. What do you think his success is due to? As we started to get this both polarization and, and that included regression in many cases to just these absolutistic retribalized points of view where people, again, if they were discussing their tribe, they weren't saying, this is what my tribe has in common with this tribe and this tribe and this tribe. It says, this is how my tribe's different from that tribe, and it deserves some sort of special something or other. And again, there very well could be tribes that deserve special attention, certainly. But the point is, if you're just emphasizing that, and you're not emphasizing how that tribe is part of a unified overall tribal structure, then that is just retribalization, that is regression, and the only ultimate endpoint of that really is just warfare, and I mean, it's just no way around it. And humanity fought 300,000 years to get over that stage. So among other things, it could bring in women's rights and bring in an end of slavery and bring in the end of the untouchables and start including every minority you can think of, LGBTQ, transgender. Um, this was you know, extraordinary. But as it started to, to, to fall apart and get rocky, and what started to get left out as green became just extreme, absolutistic, and started devolving into nihilism and narcissism, or even regressed to absolutistic, ethnocentric. The only people you had supporting these original liberal values 
which are absolutely crucial to any higher stage. The whole point about these stages of development is that each higher stage, again, transcends but includes the previous stage. And green didn't transcend and include orange, transcended and repressed orange. That's the definition of pathology. And that's one of the real problems with that. So uh, if you have an integral thinker and they're looking out there to see what is really missing is that's, what, that's how an integral thinker thinks is, wait, there's a little bit of truth in all of this. How, how, how are we including all of these things? And you're thinking that way and you look out there and, you, and if you are, for example, uh, a professor teaching at a university, one of the things you start to notice is this extraordinary lack of traditional liberal values. Those aren't protective. Those, you get some lip service to them. But again, it's usually in terms of um, words like equality. And as we've seen, there's two different definitions of equality. There's orange equality, which means freedom. And there's green equality, which means equity, equal outcome versus equal opportunity. And so some of the right, of course, were supporting that. And a lot of the people, like Dave Rubin, had, had said, okay, I'm, just, I'm no longer a, a leftist. And what became real clear is that left and liberal were no longer the same. The old original leftists were liberals, but the new leftists were illiberals. They were anti liberal. And that's a disaster. You can't go forward with that kind of pathology. And so if you're somebody like Jordan Peterson, who is thinking integrally, and you're looking around and seeing what the hell's going on, and you're starting to notice this, and then a government comes along and says, oh, and by the way, I'm going to compel your speech. That would send anybody with integrity and integral thinking over the wall. And so he was up you know, all night. He did those three videos on um, you know, forcing uh, unconscious bias retraining and political correctness and what he saw happening with that and the, and the nightmare of Bill C-16. Threw him up on the net and went viral. And the main cause of that, in my opinion, is that it's these orange liberal values of equal opportunity that were getting crushed between the extreme far left of green and the strong far right of ethnocentric amber. And these liberal values in between were just getting left out of the, out of the picture. And that was a disaster. And that was the thing that at least put Jordan Peterson on the map. And he was arguing against Bill C-16 because not only that it put into law a constructivist view of human identity, that was his complaint. It had nothing to do with transgender people. And the people that attacked him for being anti-transgender had absolutely nothing to do with that. And he's very clear about that. What it was, was putting into actual law a constructivist view of human nature, which, by the way, is pure green. It's pure postmodern green viewpoint. And that also is an attack on free speech in the worst possible way. What I found really fascinating about Jordan Peterson watching especially the Maps of Meaning series, is that he is also attempting a real integral theory of everything. What, what was it, and your, this, this reminded me very much of your project. How, did, how do you feel that his thought maps onto yours, and what are the core differences? There are a couple of different um, aspects of, of integral uh, meta theory that, that could come to play in, in here, and I, and I want to make it as non-academic uh, as, 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 uh, as possible. One of the things that um, 
I have a really, really deep appreciation of Jordan Peterson for is the, the, um, the process that I call showing up has to do with what we call four quadrants. And I can, I can um, make that fairly simple by saying that the four quadrants, for example, will shake down into things like the good, the true, and the beautiful. And people are fairly aware of that. They're a, a very widely known, widely accepted sort of trinity of different types of knowledge, different types of values, different types of methods that we use. And they each have a certain kind of truth, but those truths differ. Point about Jordan Peterson is that he has an enormous amount of respect for objective science. And he's always anchoring or at least correlating what he's saying with some sort of neurophysiological um, research or anthropological research or big five-factor analysis research or so on. But what he realizes is that there are these other validity claims that aren't just objective, material, exterior truth. And these other things are damned important. And as a matter of fact, they are important. And one of the disasters of the Western Enlightenment was that it ended up going from an understanding where what it was emphasizing, according to Charles Taylor, the most dominant idea in the Western Enlightenment was what the French philosophers called the system de la nature, the great whole interlocking system as a whole. John Locke actually called it the great interlocking order. The second most common idea in the Western Enlightenment, according to author Lovejoy, was the great chain of being. And we usually don't think of that with the Western Enlightenment, but the great chain of being was a, a viewpoint of reality that, as Lovejoy demonstrates in his book called The Great Chain of Being, is the single most widely adopted overall philosophy that, that the larger percentage of sensitive, educated men and women have adopted throughout virtually all of our civilizations up to and including the Western Enlightenment. So when the Western Enlightenment started doing, when, when uh, Kepler was measuring planetary motion and, and Galileo was measuring earthly motion and Newton was measuring gravitation and laws of motion, none of them were worried about being reductionistic because they all believed in the great interlocking order and they all believed in the great chain of being. So they weren't worried about anything happening to that. But the problem is they were continuing to basically measure all of this stuff. And you can't really measure these interior left-hand subjective and inner subjective realities very well. You can measure exterior matter well. And so the more science kept going forward, the more the Enlightenment ended up almost accidentally with an official philosophy of what's often called scientific materialism. And so Yes, we believe in the whole interlocking order of nature, but only as far as you can see it in an objective, materialistic way. Well, it's very holistic and it's very interwoven. It's just all exterior, objective truth. So it has no interiors. There's no beauty. There's no morals. There's no aesthetics. There's no love. There's none of that fits into a standard systems theory. Doesn't work. So Peterson at the very least, intuitively knows that those quadrants are real. Those dimensions are real. And not only that, they govern how we interpret the world around us. And again, that's one of the minor, true but partial aspects that postmodernism came up with, which is the world isn't just a perception, it's a conception, it's an interpretation. We have to interpret these things that we see. And that's an important partial truth. And nobody denies that, including Peterson, which is why the things he attacks in postmodernism are all the extremist, regressive, you know, outrageously idiotic aspects of it. But he still uses some of its core ideas. 
because those are real and they're there, and he, and he uses them and he knows it. But he's looking at these interpretive schemes, and he's really attempting to find out what those are. And one of his closely allied issues to that was looking at totalitarian systems and saying, why does that happen? And became, by his own account, quite obsessed with that for decades. Um, and I very much enjoy his conclusions. Um, but so he has these notion of maps of meaning. And then he would frequently start referring to those as archetypal. Um, and, um, and that's the way he, for example, would start interpreting religion. And, and he's given all these recent, you know, several hour long talks about sort of every aspect of Genesis. And he's just moving, you know, through the Bible and doing that. And all of that is, uh, is very important. And I agree with a great deal of that. The, a lot of times when it comes to Jordan Peterson, it's, it's, it's not that I'll disagree with much of what he says. I, I, I agree with much of what he says. It's some of the things that he leaves out. And I find this a little bit interesting because he's clearly an integral thinker. And um, let, me, uh, let me give one more example of what second tier means um, using a fairly well um, uh, researched uh, developmental model that was developed by Michael Commons and Richards. And they just call it a um, hierarchical uh, model. But we really have to emphasize the understanding uh, that there are two types of hierarchies. And this is what Green absolutely overlooks, and it's a disaster. There are dominator hierarchies, and there are growth hierarchies, or actualization hierarchies. Dominator hierarchies are all the horrible things that postmodernists say they are. They're tyrannical, they're power structured, they're uh, oppressive, they're the cause of almost every nightmare you can think of in human history. And you want to do as much as you can to get rid of those as much as you possibly can. But then there are growth hierarchies. Those are the opposite of, do literally the opposite of dominator hierarchies. In a dominate... Are those the same thing as what Peterson would describe as hierarchies of competence? Close to it. The dominator hierarchies, the higher you go in a dominator hierarchy, the more people you can oppress, the more people you can hurt, the more exclusive you are. The higher you go in a growth hierarchy, the more inclusive you are. You actually are including more people. We saw that simple developmental model that goes from just me to a group, to all groups, to all humans, to integrating all of those. That's a growth hierarchy. And the, what's so ironic and horrifying is that the postmodernists in their extreme verb collapse these. And so they don't see that the values that they represent, to the extent they represent values, so egalitarian values, for example, or um, values of identity or diversity, you're not born with those values. And of those sort of six to eight stages of development, there's only one stage that has those values, and that's green. But green is the result of about five stages of growth hierarchical development. And when you pull the rug out from under all hierarchies, you pull the rug out, you pull the ladder out from getting to your own values. It's suicidal. It's absolutely self-destructive. And so in a sense, they've almost given up on that. And that's why they end up getting just very absolutistic and just sort of yelling slogans and regressing to ethnocentric and all of that kind of stuff. So these hierarchies um, are clearly important. 
And by the way, just that whole notion of a growth hierarchy, Peterson rather famously traced it back to lobsters. And he was simply trying to demonstrate that, the, that some of these hierarchies are absolutely necessary. We can't get around them. And they're certainly not the product of Western capitalistic tyrannical patriarchy. They back like whatever is 350 million years or something like that to, to the lobsters. But in fact, those kinds of growth hierarchies, um, which are also, Arthur Kessler coined the term holarchy, because each of its stages is a holon. And a holon is a whole that's part of a larger whole. And almost everything in the, in the universe is a holon. And so even if you go back and just look at the overall evolutionary sequence, going all the way back to the Big Bang, you go from atoms to molecules to cells to organisms to then even more complex, differentiated, and evolved organisms. Each one of those is getting more inclusive. And they transcend and include. Literally, molecules go beyond atoms, but they enfold them. They actually include them. Molecules don't hate atoms. They don't oppress atoms. They don't exclude atoms. If anything, they love them. I mean, they're actually hugging them. That's what growth hierarchies do. And if you're really serious about values of inclusion and diversity and comprehensiveness, you need a growth holarchy. You need a growth hierarchy. And by the way, the only people that use dominator hierarchies are people at low stages on growth hierarchies. And everybody on a higher stage of growth hierarchy criticizes dominator hierarchies. That's how you get to do it. And that's why the postmodernists were criticizing it, is because they were at this relatively high stage of development, even as they started to go extreme and sort of mess it up. So the one area where I would like to see Peterson give more attention is that um, is, is the actual amount of research we have on growth hierarchies in terms of some specific stages that they go through. Um, it, there's a certain reason that, that those tended to drop out of, of academia. And that is in the 1960s, as we said, in 1959, the percent of the population at Green, postmodern multicultural Green, was about 3%. And then <clears throat> it really started to explode during the 60s. And if you were a really smart, leading edge thinker at the time, you were Green. You were thinking these kinds of things. You were reading Foucault, and you were reading Derrida, and you were taking these things very seriously. And they were emphasizing contextualism. They were emphasizing constructivism. They were emphasizing the interplay between perspectives. If there aren't dominant perspectives, you have to take them all into account. There's all partial truths in all of that, and the smart, smart people were pushing those edges. They managed to move into education and would literally, in a, in a generation, end up almost dominating it. So we have essentially a green, and, and often broken green, um, a system of education that goes all the way down to first grade now. So even in, in like third and fourth grade, kids will be given um, handouts on white supremacy and you know everybody who's white has to sort of see that and apologize for being in all of that kind of stuff. Um, so they managed to take over uh, education in terms of the number of professors that were conservative versus progressive. In about 1950, the ratio from uh, progressive to conservative was about four to one. Today, according to Jonathan Haidt's research, it's about 20 to one. Um, as Peterson will say, there just are no conservatives in human sciences. And in a sense, that's right. 
And that's a real problem um, in terms of actually having a balanced uh, overview of these things. In the 60s, as green started to emerge, and this is one of the reasons that we don't see much of a discussion about development in academia today. As green came in and started to take over evolution, its major, one of its major beliefs is that all hierarchies are bad because they've confused growth hierarchies and dominator hierarchies. And so during the 40s and 50s, and some a bit earlier, we had all of these really pioneering developmental psychologists that were studying these areas really for the first time. And so um, if you look at all of the sort of dozen or so multiple intelligences, and again, if you don't like that concept, I know Peterson doesn't like that, you can just think about it as, as um, multiple areas of, of expertise or capacity. So mathematics, music, cognitive development, moral development, uh, emotional development, ego development, values development, uh, and so on. All of these pioneering developmentalists tended to be focusing on just sort of one of these lines. So Piaget tended to focus on cognitive development. Kohlberg tended to focus on moral development. Uh, Maslow tended to focus on motivational development. Jane Lovinger focused on ego development. They didn't have a real good understanding of that at that time, but the research they were doing was really good, and the stages they came up with, again, showed um, both the differences that were actually there, because they were each of them looking at a different developmental line of development, but the stages were essentially similar, and you could map those across to all of these lines. Well, in the 60s, as green starts to emerge and come into the culture, and particularly as it starts to take over academia, what started to happen is that all systems that had anything to do with hierarchies were thrown out. And developmental psychology itself was just devastated by that. I mean, there were entire departments of developmental psychology just closing down. And so a lot of the really, really great developmentalists, the really pioneering ones that we still look at today, in a sense, they all circled the wagons at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And so, you know, interestingly, they weren't in the psychology department. The psychology had already gotten rid of all those nasty hierarchies. But in education, you actually had to produce results. You had to actually educate people. So you actually had to know the stages they went through. So all of these developmentalists are over in the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I mean, really, the, the great ones. Um, Lawrence Kohlberg was there, Jane Lovinger was there, Kurt Fisher was there, Howard Gardner was there, Robert Keegan was there. I mean, it was outrageous. Um, and, and they're still over there, basically, um, doing that. Um, and at Integral Institute, we sent a lot of students out to, uh, to study with them. Um, these are some really, really great people, um, people like Robert Keegan. And, uh, so, um, but the whole even topic of developmental um, studies was just immediately read as, wait a minute, you're saying this person's better than this person. And we're going, no, that's not what they're saying. I mean, you, Mr. Social Activist, you're saying it's better not to be prejudiced. You're saying it's better to, be, to treat all people fairly, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. That's exactly what growth hierarchies are saying, except that those values are the result of several stages of growth. You're not, at six months old, you're not born with those values and you're running around with a little you know, sign protesting. Um, but it just sort of fell out of academia discussion almost entirely. 
and even smart people um, who know about the importance of hierarchies and the difference between competence hierarchies and inequality hierarchies. It's just not a topic that tends to uh, enter their awareness because mostly in any of the schooling they got, it really wasn't a topic ever. And so it's just something that kind of dropped off uh, the radar. And it's one of the reasons that when we talk about an integral framework, those are one of the areas that we include because there's an enormous amount of evidence for them. And in particular, they have such a, a strong explanatory uh, power. They help us understand what's happening. And, what, and, and the sort of summary of all of that is that as we look at the culture wars today, what we find just in terms of developmental studies is that it, in this, this whole first tier set of stages, the highest three, the three that have most recently occurred and are still present. Everybody is born in square one and has to move through these. So we still have a fair number of people at ethnocentric, a fair number of people at orange, world-centric, and a fair number of people at green, multicultural. But those upper three are at each other's throats. They really don't like each other. They've increasingly come to hate each other in many ways, and they're at each other's throats. And the problem is because they're all first tier, they can't solve that problem ever. Because by definition, first tier thinks that its values are the only correct ones. But second tier, that has the inherent capacity to see the importance of all of these and at least start thinking about ways, okay, since everybody has to go through all of these, then an enlightened society would include ways to help us do that. And so that's one of the things that is a way out of the culture wars. In addition to whatever else we might need to do, and there are plenty of other things. But this is crucial, because if we still have people that really are at values, that are absolutely committed to not integrating everything, then you're not going to get them integrated, ever. There's no motivation that wants to do that. And so that's why a second tier integral orientation becomes so important. And that's why people that are really looking to help draw together paradigms and cross paradigms, to actually integrate the, these number of uh, different disciplines and approaches becomes so absolutely crucial. There's a big debate in many integral communities about Jordan Peterson. And one of the most frequently expressed perspectives is how can he be integral when he is so anti-green? If you look at just the actual developmental maps of what happens at these stages, if you look at Commons and Richards, for example, um, or if you look at Kurt Fisher, or if you look at, at any of the... Um, stages that are trying to say specifically, okay, this is what happens in mathematical reasoning or in cognitive reasoning or in emotional awareness or in aesthetics or so on. And they, and they lay them out. As I said, one uh, or several of the things that tend to get laid out at the meta-systemic level, one is that it's just that, it's meta-systemic. It introduces a fourth-person perspective, which just means it can reflect on the universal third-person perspectives that Orange brought into existence and that were so profound for the Western world. But that fourth-person perspective is a capacity to actually reflect on that and make sort of certain critical announcements about it. It can appreciate it or it can disagree with it, but it can do that. Peterson does that. He's fully aware of doing that. He's using that metasystemic uh, capacity. But he also has the capacity for paradigmatic and, and, and uh, cross-paradigmatic thinking. So he, he doesn't just reflect on those things, he tries to tie them together. I mean, he, he'll say one of the things, for example, that um, Piaget was trying to do was to integrate science and religion. And that's one of the things that, that he very much wants to do. Um, and so he does 
he is making use of those capacities, although he's also transcended and included. So he's using capacities that will um, encompass the limitations of having just that stage. Because it's just that stage that gets us lost in radical egalitarianism and relativism and all of that. It's not a really good stage to only have access to. But he doesn't. He has access to paradigmatic and cross-paradigmatic stuff. Um, in terms of um, anger, um, this uh, the fact that you're at an integral stage doesn't mean that, first of all, it doesn't mean that you, have, you can have no shadow elements. You do. You're just repressing elements from the integral stages. And that certainly can happen. Um, and so, um, and he knows shadow material very well, and he's made an enormous uh, amount of, uh, given an enormous amount of studying to it, uh, particularly in the line of Jung. Um, and so he knows his own shadow, and, and, and he, I'm sure he's perfectly aware that he still has some of it. Um, I think that his anger is one that is, in a sense, a type of, um, it's almost a kind of existential anger. It's almost a kind of um, anger that looks at something that just from the most number of perspectives seems just patently wrong, just patently mistaken. Um, now again, I, you know, I think every discipline has some degree of truth because I don't think any discipline is capable of just being 100% wrong. There'd be no reason it would be ad adopted if it was just nothing but wrong. Every time you tried it, you would give it up. <coughs> um, but they can do things that are so dysfunctional and they can be so broken and that's one of the things that's happened to leading edge green. It is a fundamentally broken green. And that's, for example, in, I did this book on Trump in a post-truth world, um, and tried to indicate how that broken green was a large part of that political movement that we're seeing today. And that's the problem with green. It's not a healthy leading edge. And that's a real, real problem because it is leading edge. What's starting to take over that leading edge is second tier. Because again, we have about 5%, 6% there. When it gets close to 10%, then it's officially going to be a leading edge. And there's going to be some sort of tipping point. We're going to see that happening. So in terms of uh, any number of individuals in the dark web, um, who, again, most of them, I think, are operating with integral cognitive capacities, um, doesn't stop any of them from having um, uh, very specific existential anger issues at things that they see and think that are wrong. Um, I think that if you sit down and actually look at the items that uh, are included in each particular stage and see how those fundamental items are taken up and included in the next stage and then those are taken up and included in the next stage. Um, I think people could see how somebody like Jordan Peterson is making use of those fundamental intrinsic factors of that stage. But a lot of people say he doesn't transcend and include green. You think he does? I, I think he does. Um, and I think the part of Green that he doesn't like is the extremist um, identity politics, um, neo-Marxist aspects. And my point is simply that if you look at virtually any developmental model of cognitive development, you will see a stage of development that's variously we call dialectical or relativistic or multicultural or whatever it is and it's just introducing a new perspective 
that can then reflect on the previous perspective, and that perspective can reflect on the previous perspective, and so on. And those are real capacities, real characteristics, and those are included in um, almost every dark web intellectual that we have. But then you're allowed to get angry with various aspects of any of these things. And that anger might be what you could call just sort of a pure, um, entirely justified anger. Or it could be some of your own shadow material. Uh, nobody ever ultimately escapes all shadow material. It's always there. And I would develop a shadow. If I have some shadow material, it runs in the direction that Jordan Peterson does, which is I've sort of been writing in this general field now for maybe 50 years. And so I just watch daily the postmodern theorists come in. And initially they were making interesting points, but then they got caught in relativism. That started to degenerate into nihilism and narcissism, and that just went off the deep end. And we completely lost almost any of the value at that point. And that was very disturbing and very angry making for me. I, it really was infuriating. You share his anger. It's what? You share his anger. Oh, yeah, very much. Um, and I see some of the positive factors that led it to become the postmodern movement. I mean, the whole point about there's traditionalism, then there was modernism, then there was postmodernism, is those are very real developmental unfoldings. Be because that's the point that many people would say you and he differ, is that he doesn't seem to see any positive value in postmodernism. That's right. And I believe it's because there's been this enormous downplay in academia of looking at almost any of the real developmental sequences. Um, so again, if, if you look at Piaget, um, and, 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 uh, or even, even Carl Jung, I mean, Peterson says that the single best book on Jungian psychology is um, it's Eric von Neumann's uh, I think Origin History of Consciousness, and I happen to agree. I was absolutely blown away by that book. I, I read it several times and even outlined it two or three times. But the whole point about his book was the stages that consciousness went through, and each stage had a different cognitive capacity. Each stage saw the world completely differently. There were different worldviews at all of these. And that's what's so profoundly stunning about the developmental viewpoint. And it's certainly true of Piaget, but that never gets mentioned with Jordan. I've never heard him say, oh, and there's a worldview down here that looks like this, and in the worldview here it looks like this. Piaget is stages, even though he loves Piaget. That aspect of developmental studies just got shoved off the burner. And so if he were actually looking, for example, at the ingredients that each of these stages add, I don't think he would disagree with any of those ingredients. And given the fact that we have a fair amount of evidence that these things ha have to emerge in stages, because the whole of one stage actually becomes an ingredient of the whole of the next stage. So they are holons. The whole of one stage is part of the next stage. The whole of that stage is part of that stage. So you can't actually get to a higher stage without including that lower stage. And so what are we including? Well, you're, you're pre-operational, you're including the capacity for images, and then concept, symbols, and then concepts, and then rules, and then formal operational matter rules, and then systemic paradigms, and then cross paradigms. And these are first person, second person, third person, fourth person, fifth person perspectives. All of those are added. I don't think he disagrees with any of those. And particularly if you actually looked at, okay, here's the skill that you add here, here's the skill you add here, and so on. And at least see these broad, broad stages of that kind of development. I don't think he'd have any trouble with that. Um, and if he did, then I would just say, well, I agree with these hundred developmental maps that do see evidence in those, and I understand that you don't, and that's fine. Um, 
But much more common nowadays um, are things like the big five factor analysis. I totally agree with that. It's part of what we call types. It's an actual ingredient of the integral framework. We totally include that. But again, types are something that stay essentially the same no matter what stage you're at. You can start to shift a little bit, but basically they stay the same. That's what a type is. Um, and so, and it also goes, for example, if you even talk about types of male and female interaction or interests or traits, those stay essentially similar as you grow and develop. So you can look at all the things that all these stages have in common, and that's fine. They're real. They're there. But so are the stages. I mean, that's sort of the whole point, is you have these dramatically different worldviews about how things look and act and what they mean. And they're there, they're real, and they have an enormous explanatory power. So that's one of the areas that, that we include in these five, six, seven aspects of, a, of an integral, integral model. And you, you just mentioned male and female, yeah. and that's, that's something that Peterson has been criticized for quite a lot. He, for equating the masculine with order and the feminine with chaos. Right. This is a theological point, and maybe it's a simplified theological point. Right. What, what do you make of that perspective? It's not my favorite aspect. Of, of what he does. Um, I can agree with um, the importance of order and chaos, and even to some extent the way he connects it with left and right brain hemisphere, um, and that these are two of the very, very fundamental uh, dualisms that this manifest world is made of. Um, but but the the direct connection of, and he doesn't just identify, he doesn't say female is chaos and male is order. He says female is symbolic of, it, it doesn't make it much better though. Um, that doesn't, um, I don't find that a terribly compelling piece of information. Um, and, and I find that it does, um, that there are other ways uh, to, if you're going to try to describe just general statistical differences between men and women, uh, that one of them is symbolic of chaos and one of them is symbolic of order is not one of the ones that we find very useful. Uh, and I don't think um, a whole lot of either men or women directly connect with that. I don't think they find that very meaningful. Um, he also, of course, will... Uh, identify in general, and that's that's one of the problems. Not many people understand statistics, and so if you say sixty percent of the most aggressive people are men and forty percent are women, people will think you're saying you know that it's just either or, and that's just one of the problems. Is that people that aren't really sophisticated on these things are really misinterpreting what he's saying anyway. I wanted to bring in something I've heard David Dada say before, that theologically you can identify the masculine principle with the witnessing consciousness yeah. and the feminine with the witnessed. Yeah, yes. it, it, does that help? Is that a more, is that a definition that might help ex expand this perspective? Well, at this point what you are getting into um, is uh, um, a lot of different types of systems that, um, you know, the fact that men and women have been on this planet for, you know, a couple million years, um, there have been at least certain types of differences that we've noticed. If nothing else, women give birth and lactate. Men, on average, have a slightly greater upper body strength. So you can take um, a really brilliant feminist systems theorist like Janet Schaff is, and she'll say that um, what we have to do in order to understand the differences in, in the different roles that men and women have had 
is that we do have to start with at least a few biological universals and then look at how those play themselves out in different uh, techno-economic modes, for example. Um, and that's an important type of addition. It's part of what we call showing up in integral because we're looking at all four quadrants. And the techno-economic mode is the lower right quadrant. It's you're looking at a society from an exterior objective fashion. And the, many, the stages that are often used there, for example, are Gerhard Linsky, who came up with the stages of foraging or hunting and gathering, and then horticultural, agrarian, industrial, and informational. And Janet Chaffetz took just those two biological differences and showed how they produce dramatically different roles for men and women at these different techno-economic modes. It's one of the reasons you have to take quadrants into account when you make these kinds of statements. So even given those differences that are pretty hard to deny, at least in terms of biological, what we say upper right, exterior of an individual viewpoint, in foraging, um, sex roles were just barely being differentiated anyway, but the men tended to do those items that required upper body strength, so they tended to do hunting and would tend to be uh, more warriors. Uh, and then women tended to give birth and lactate, and they just sort of played, played that out. When you get to horticultural, you start to see a real shift. Um, horticultural is the first form of farming, and it's defined as farming that just uses a simple digging stick or hoe. And the important thing about that is that um, a pregnant woman can do that kind of farming without any real harm to her. And Chavez estimates that in horticultural societies, about 80% of the food stuff were produced by women. And so they clearly are having an enormous impact in the public productive sphere. They're not just in the private reproductive sphere. And as a matter of fact, in horticultural societies, one study showed that approximately one-third of horticultural societies had female-only deities. And these are all the great mother societies. And when these matriarchal societies were first discovered under the patriarchal society. There was a massive discovery. It was like, wow! Uh, and of course the feminists jumped all over. It's like, you know, women were first and then men took it away and all of that. But it was a huge discovery. And it was discovering just this horticultural base and the way that took differences in human biology but still played them out very differently in terms of roles. Men were still kind of trying to go off and do hunting and stuff, but women were producing 80% of the food because that was coming from farming. And so they had a role in, in the public uh, productive sphere. And again, about a third of those, of those uh, deities were female only. And that's almost the only place you find that. Whenever you find a great mother society, it tends to be horticultural. Well, then agrarian came into being. That was farming done with an extremely heavy animal-drawn plow. Now, according to Chavez, women that did that suffered an extremely high rate of miscarriage. And it was to their Darwinian advantage not to do that. Plus, the, just the heaviness of the damn thing tended to select for men in their upper body strength. And so there was a big change and one of the things that we find, there were other causes, but looking at this, almost, this is an almost Marxist orientation, but um, it, the deities in agrarian cultures are 95% are male only. And if you want to start talking about something like a patriarchy, that's where you could really start to point at that and say, that's really patriarchal. Chavez's point is that but you can't just say it's oppression. Women were choosing not to do that. And there are actually some studies of those kinds of uh, patriarchal cultures that showed quality of life was much less for men than it was for women. 
Nevertheless, women did tend to then be in the private reproductive sphere, men in the public productive sphere, and that tended to start to get that kind of patriarchal orientation. Um, again, you have to be very careful about saying that was just men oppressing women. Um, that's something that really drives Peterson crazy. Um, and, I, and I share some of that because it takes away the agency of women. And, and I found that one of the most disturbing factors of the feminist theories that tried to do that and tried to blame all female conditions to oppression because it takes away their agency as if they actually had nothing to say or do about these societies. Whereas they really were contributing in at least some important ways to how these were done. Um, I don't know what women, those feminists know, that think that women would just acquiesce like sheep to everything that the men did to control them. But these aren't the women I know. I, I don't know where they're finding these women, but apparently that happened. Um, then when you start to get to industrial cultures, now you start to get a real shift because now machines are doing the work on nature that human bodies used to have to do. And that takes that pressure out. So now there's no longer as strong a selection for male body upper strength and female birth and lactation. And so here we start to see again universal modes of morality. We start to see the rise of the women's movement. We start to see the freeing of slaves and abolition. And all of this is going against the traditional roles that were laid down during agrarian, which is men do all the public making decisions, women stay home and run the household and the family. And those were roles that both of them were stuck with. It's not like one of those was a whole lot of fun and the other was miserable. I mean, men died eight years sooner. They had to fight in war. They had virtually all of the um, death-inducing jobs they had. Um, the state could force them to give their lives. Uh, Warren Farrell called them the disposable sex. I mean, just it wasn't that the, it, it, they just had it all bad. But they didn't have it all good. It wasn't like they arranged a society that gave them the best of everything and women the worst of everything. Because if they did that, they did a shitty job. So I just, <laughs> you, that can't be an idealistic version for men. It can't be. Um, so then as we move into informational, then there's even less drive for physical force. And what we're facing now is this possibility that men and women just have different interests. And now they're more free to express them. And so Peterson's point about that is that in countries like Scandinavia, where you have the most freedom for men and women, they actually show the greatest differences in terms of preferences. And so what's that all about? Well, it's not just oppression. It could be some. But the oppression also, remember, is basically modernity gets blamed for all of these horrifying roles. But modernity was halfway through the cure. They were starting to get rid of these agrarian roles, which were very patriarchal. Again, not necessarily just through oppression, but just through the differentiation of what the sexes did. And the absolute brutality of nature and what we had to do just to stay alive. And that didn't include men having councils all the time trying to figure out how to oppress women. It was mostly men and women thinking together, what are we going to do to manage to stay alive? And yes, there was oppression. And that was during the ethnocentric era. So of course there was racism and slavery and one tribe against other tribes and all of that. Those roles are what the modern, rational, industrial society started to overcome. And then they become even more so in information. And what we're trying to do now is, because we have this leading edge green, which is broken mostly, not allowing us to even discuss these issues. 
because everything simply has to be equal outcome. And if it's not, there's discrimination, there's sexism, there's racism, there's something going on. And again, the difficulty is that it's not that those aren't occurring, it's just those aren't only occurring. There are other reasons that it's occurring, and those aren't necessarily bad. Those have to be allowed, or else you're going to start erasing those as well, and you're going to end up doing what you did with hierarchies. You're going to try to get rid of all the dominator hierarchies, and you're going to get rid of all the growth hierarchies, and you're going to have to get no way to even grow to the values that you're trying to get established. You've lost the path to it. So all you can do is protest and yell and scream, and it doesn't do any good at all. So, there's, there's a theological point. Like a lot of people are critical of Jordan Peterson because on some level he's doing a really important role of restoring the role of the father in some sense. But there is a sense that he's looking back to, like he's trying to restore Christian values and, and very masculine religious values. Could it be that actually we're seeing a theological shift so the kind of theology that we're moving into is more of a balance between masculine and feminine. Because as you've said, that the role of, of men and women is changing. So actually what we don't, we don't necessarily need a restoration of the sort of God the Father. Maybe what we need is a, is a different theological synthesis. Well, I, I think that's part of the difficulties that come, and they, they come in part because we leave out that developmental component. So we were talking a little bit earlier about just the sort of Janet Shaffitz view, uh, which, which I find there, there's some genuine truth to that as part of an overall integral framework. Um, <clears throat> but you can see how there were shifts from more matrifocal societies to more patra focal societies and then to societies that started to try to overcome those and those newer stages of development certainly industrialization and information to the extent that those had an effect on our culture and they did they're not something you found in the bible there's not something you found in early civilization now jordan might say yeah but we had the seeds for all that there and i go right but notice that still took a while to unfold, and many of those early stages didn't have that. And many of these existential or even transcendental important givens that were being embedded in religion, those also tended to unfold, even though we can find in the Judeo-Christian tradition this tendency that would um, eventually lead to uh, individual rights, even if it wasn't that often expressed in a full extent uh, in, in the original um, orientation. And particularly since most of the world's great religions um, did arise during <clears throat> periods like the Great Axial Period, roughly a millennia or so BCE, those really were the era, Gene Gepsu's era, of just the modern mythic era. And, and um, for a lot of the religions created at that time, there were, again, these two different aspects. There was a, a very small number that were involved in waking up, actually having this transformative Satori experience of ultimate unity consciousness. But most of them were just, okay, what do I have to do to stay on the good side of this God? What do I have to do here? Or here's a history of my people, or something like that. When it says, Moses parted the Red Sea. When that was first written, when the person sat down and wrote, Moses parted the Red Sea, they didn't have some deep symbolic meaning to that. It didn't mean, oh, the Israelites had to overcome a lot of problems, and we looked at our leader, Moses, and he could, he could help do away with, with blockades, like moving a Red Sea, and that was all symbolic. And then we moved out and found our own promised land. That's not what the person meant when they wrote, 
Moses parted the Red Sea. They meant this guy named Moses stood next to the Red Sea and he went whack and the sea parted and they walked across. That's what he meant. And so again, when James Fowler was actually measuring these developmental stages of religious belief systems, and again, like most developmental models, he found six to eight major stages of development, and they were versions of archaic to magic to mythic, rational, pluralistic, and integral. Most of these were what he actually called mythic literal, because the myths were meant literally. And so you'll notice when Peterson tells us the meaning of Genesis, or the meaning of Exodus, or those kinds of things, he doesn't agree with the literal meaning. And the literal meaning is what the original writers meant. That's what they were saying. But he's trying to read something deeper into that. And that might be there, and, and to some extent, of course it is, simply because societies have not only their explicit conscious understandings, but all sorts of, of infrastructure interactions and mechanical systems that are occurring that we know nothing about or don't really understand. So all of that's fine. And we do have those whole left-hand, first and second person um, implicit rules and patterns of behavior that we're really not that much aware of. So he, it's okay for him looking for those. But one of the reasons that he, he won't himself just say, yeah, I believe that, he doesn't believe Moses really parted the Red Sea. Not literally. So that's not what he's talking about. And, and this is a little bit where the problem comes in. Because if you're going to do that, and you're going to look for these underlying rules and patterns, the really best evidence is that those unfold, those develop, those have changed. We don't look at human sacrifice the way we did 4,000 years ago. There are different implicit rules for that. We did do that at archaic to magic periods, but then we grew out of those. And there are different grammars, different rules at each of these stages. And the same goes for how men and women have interacted. Even if we agree with, let's say, a big five statistical analysis that uh, men have more industriousness and women have more agreeableness and negative emotions. We say, okay, that's fine. But just as we saw with the Janet Shafiz analysis of the male and female roles at different techno-economic eras, even though it's the same biology, there can be these differences in terms of what's masculine and what's feminine. And so if we want to choose some of those things that have some sort of truth today, and then we're going to track them all the way back, you know, two, three thousand years ago, um, we have to be very careful about how we do that. And one of the things that I think will help Peterson's explanation of religion is if he does look at these different stages of religion, the actual beliefs as they unfolded, and not simply sort of put them all together as a single narrative and then try to read the existential underlying rules for all of them. Because that's, that, that's a little bit dicey if you really are looking at different ways that human beings develop through their spiritual understanding. And again, I'll just mention James Fowler very quickly. Um, he was one of the pioneers that was looking at these different capacities that humans have. In this case, he looked at something that we would call spiritual intelligence. So like cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, moral intelligence, there's a spiritual intelligence. That's different from direct spiritual experience. Direct spiritual experience, that's waking up again. And we can talk a little bit about that because Peterson is perfectly aware of waking up. He's he, absolutely aware of it. But he doesn't really talk about that. 
So he talks about more the growing up components and how that happened, but he doesn't take a look at some of these different stages, like Gebser's archaic, magic, mythic, interrational with the Western culture, and then into the multicultural, pluralistic postmodernism. Valor found that, and he defined God the way Tillich did as concern or as um, an ultimate concern. So whatever your ultimate concern is, if you make a list of the most important of the most important of the most important things in your life, whatever the top of that list is is your ultimate important thing. That's your God, whatever it is. It could be atheism, and you're still using spiritual intelligence because whenever you think about ultimate realities. That's what you're engaged in. That's the intelligence that you activate when you think like that. And the Fowler found that it really did go through these very distinct identifiable stages. And then if you combine that with uh, people that have done historical work like Gene Gebser, you see some real similarities in, in those things. Um, and they are profoundly different. I mean, you really can have a spiritual worldview that's magic. Um, voodoo tends to be an example of magic. Magic is the idea, and it tends to occur in developmental sequences fairly early because the human organism is learning to differentiate itself from the environment. And in the process where it's learning to do that, it hasn't quite succeeded, and so its mental image of a thing isn't really well differentiated from the thing. So it thinks that to manipulate its mental idea of the thing is to actually magically change the thing. So if I make a doll that represents you and I stick a pin in the doll, I've actually hurt you. That's magic. And we all have magic, we all have superstition, but that tends to be one of the earliest stages of cognitive development when the earliest stages of spiritual intelligence and so on. And it is magic. Um, as it starts to move towards mythic, you get a stage that spiral dynamics, for example, calls power gods. Because you realize there's still magic, or you think there's still magic in the world, but it's you don't have it anymore. You keep trying, it really doesn't work, so you sort of give up. But others have it. So mommy, for example, could change the yucky spinach into candy if she wanted, because she's a power god. And so if you want to be on the good side of your power god, you have to know how to be nice to it, you have to know what it wants to say, and so you can develop these whole rituals or types of prayers and so on. And eventually that magic it retreats into just supernatural beings, Zeus or Apollo, or Yahweh, God, that kind of thing, and then you get the magic stage. And that occurs on up until you get the emergence of rational, which adds a third person perspective, reflects on that and goes, no, those aren't really real. If I want something, I'm going to have to do it myself through scientific experiment and, and research. So, so you're seeing those kinds of development occur in religion. And, and what Peterson does is he won't himself profess belief in any of what those stages actually say. Like I say, he doesn't really believe that Moses actually parted the Red Sea. He doesn't really believe that Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. Uh-uh. But that's what the people that had that belief, that's what they believed. Now, how much they are also being influenced by these hidden factors that he sees what was really happening, that's a little bit more open to debate. I think they are there. But I think you do see shifts as development undergoes because they just aren't the same fundamental rules at those different kinds of viewpoints. And you had to take those into a, a account. And so that's one of the concerns with that. Now, his argument with Sam Harris is, Harris focuses exactly on what they're saying. And that's what he says, and that's wrong. 
And so he'll actually criticize Moses really parting the Red Sea. And he'll say, that's just false. We don't need it. Get rid of it. And then Peterson is, and, and Sam is doing it because he, he's not an eliminative materialist. But he does still tend to kind of reduce everything to third person determined causality. And there's no room for freedom in in in, in that at all. And so he'll he'll uh, take all of those actual literal statements of religion leading up to science, and he'll say all of that is just flat out bloody wrong. It has no business being there. It was a stupid mistake we made from the beginning. It's still around. We've got to get rid of it. Nothing good. And he's all doing it from that third person deterministic scientific stance. And Peterson is always going to know, wait a minute. There are these interior left hand subjective and inner subjective realities. And yeah, okay, it's not actually Moses part of the Red Sea, but it is these really existential means that help us develop value systems in the first place, including a value for third-person science. That you just don't get that out of midair. That comes from this implicit belief system that you can see in these religions. But this is where they really are at cross-purposes, because they're not really arguing the same thing at all, and both of them are leaving out these developmental stages. So what Sam really doesn't like is magic and mythic views of ultimate concern. He doesn't like them in Islam. He doesn't like them in Christianity. He doesn't like them wherever he sees them. And at the time that they existed, it was, in a sense, the best we could do. But today, yes, you can do better in terms of the types of truth that might be uh, attempting, attempting to, to, to be disclosed there. You can do better in many cases using a type of scientific third-person approach. But there still are all these interiors, and they still have various rules and patterns that govern them. And you can't get those just through an objective view of science. And that's where Sam is always holding out. Now, the last thing I want to say just very quickly is that both of them are fully aware of waking up. And neither of them include that in their argument. And it's weird because the actual super core of a spiritual system is the system of waking up. It's not developing a series of beliefs that, okay, I believe Moses really did that, and yes, I believe Christ really was born from a biological virgin, and if I agree to everything it says in the Apostle Creed, which is a list of myths, and I believe everything it says in the Nicene Creed, another list of myths, and I sign on the bottom line, that's it, I'm a Christian. I'm saved forever in a mythic world view and, and so on. That's not what ultimate spirituality is about. Even the Christian mystics would do more like what St. Paul said. Let this consciousness be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, that we all may be one. That's a fairly good description of ultimate unity consciousness. That's what around the world there are various, at least sub-branches of religion that know about this. And it's called enlightenment, awakening, Sanskrit, it's moksha, pure freedom. Um, it's satori, it's the great liberation.